Well, hi, here we are in the fourth of the series of Joseph, this time concentrating on Genesis chapter 41. Uh, so let's have a, just a moment of prayer as we come to this scripture. Loving Father, thank you for all that you communicate through your word. Thank you, Lord, for its wisdom, its direction, its encouragement and its challenge. And we pray that we'll be all of those, Lord, as we wait upon you and the power of your Holy Spirit. It is not only the written word, it's the living word. For Jesus was the word, became the word and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Lord, speak to, through your word today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Well, let's have a look at today's scripture. And as I say, that's taking from uh, Genesis chapter 41. So here we are. And we'll just uh, read through what this has to say to us. Joseph's journey of vision, number four, tested this time with power. And, uh, and here he is, a picture standing before Pharaoh. So um, his vision was coming close by this time. Uh, this grand life vision, which Joseph had given to him through dreams from God as a young man, a 17 year old man. But, um, and, and we've commented how he had the vision and he bounced up to his brothers and said, hey, guess what brothers? This is the dream I saw. You'll all be down, bowing down to me. And then mother and father as well. And, um, but the vision had to die. The vision had to go through the pit where he abandoned really all hope through slavery, where he actually learned to toil and, and to be responsible and to do well in prison, uh, where he learned uh, more things. And God was moving him along in time and in the placing of where he was and what was happening because it was a special prison. It was the king's prison. It was Pharaoh's prison. And that's where he was. And the last time we saw how thrust into this prison were two of Pharaoh's uh, workers, the baker and the butler. Uh, and uh, Joseph had rightly interpreted their dreams that one was to be restored, the butler, and one was to be hanged, the baker. Um, uh, but the baker, the butler promptly forgot Joseph and didn't mention him to Pharaoh. Well, it wasn't time. And so we started off, we did look at just this verse. Um, then it came to pass at the end of two full years, two long dragging years uh, further on, Joseph had to manage uh, that daily routine of caring for prisoners, of being responsible, of, uh, of, of not losing his mind or um, getting the, letting captivity get the better of him. But to, and to maintain that heart and vision and faith and trust that it was going to work out. Two full years until Pharaoh had a dream, and that's when things began to move and change. So um, we'll, we'll read it through and then consider it together. And behold, uh, the dream was he stood by the river. Pharaoh was by the river, and suddenly there came out, out of the river seven cows, fine and looking fat. They fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine looking fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke, it's one of those disturbing dreams which wake you up with a disturbed, perturbed feeling. Um, so he, he wasn't having a good night. So he suddenly slept again. He slept and he dreamed a second time and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. So back comes into play our forgetful butler. Verse nine, then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. Oh dear, I remember how I didn't say anything about it. It's a fault, I've forgotten, but now it's come to mind. Well, it had come to mind at just the right time. When, he says, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, there was a young Hebrew man with us there and we told him, we told him our dreams and he interpreted our dreams for us and it came to pass just as he had interpreted for us so it happened you restored me to my office and you hanged him the baker 
Then Pharaoh called for Joseph and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. They smartened him up a bit first because he'd been in Pharaoh's dungeon now for a long time. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh and get this what he answered. He answered him saying, it's, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now I just ask you, you've been in prison all this time. The, 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 the gates and the bars have clanged open and you've been taken after all this time to a palace and you're asked to interpret a dream and it's your key to freedom. And how many would say, oh, yes, I can interpret for you. I can do that for you, Pharaoh. And, and have wanted to claim it and, and the importance of your opportunity for yourself. And yet Joseph was in this wonderful place where his immediate answer was, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I think that's just incredible. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, and he tells him the dream, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. And that would be the river Nile, of course, that runs right through Egypt. We've looked at that. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. And when they had eaten up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. And then I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this, I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Well, there you go. You might have a magician. But it comes from the dark side, that comes from the wrong side. All of their magicians and astrologers and all the things they had in these pagan countries came from the wrong side, the side of darkness, not the side of light. No wonder they couldn't explain it to them. Maybe they tried, I don't know. Then Pharaoh, sorry, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh, who's given this interpretation right away, wonderful. The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because this thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh and his, said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Now. How wonderful that uh, God gave Joseph not only an interpretation of a dream, but this godly strategy and wisdom which would run alongside it because of it. And is one thing, sometimes, you know, we say God's given me a picture and we may talk a picture but, or a dream, but it needs to be more than a picture or a dream. It needs to be an interpretation. And in actual fact, if we plunge into the wisdom and the life of Joseph here, we can see from this, it needs to be more than a dream or a picture and an interpretation. It needs to carry with it a strategy, a response, an ongoing action, which will come as a result of it. How many times does it say in the Bible, therefore? 
and they uh, and whenever it does have a look to see what it is there for because there's always a connection and indeed that's exactly what we have here now therefore because of this in as a result of what pharaoh has been shown by god which will surely come to pass therefore let pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of egypt well pharaoh was left with that conundrum good advice the advice was good in his eyes and in the eyes of all his servants and pharaoh said to his servants can we find such uh, a one as this a man in whom is the spirit of god well pharaoh turned to joseph of course then pharaoh said to joseph inasmuch as god has shown you all this there is no one as discerning and wise as you well certainly not all of his magicians astrologers and diviners and whatever else they call around them no one could interpret it like Joseph. No one, therefore, is as wise as you. You shall be over my house and over my people, uh, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard of the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph was being suddenly made number two in the whole of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And we see that process happening here with the signet ring on his hand, the gold chain around his neck, and he's going to be clothed in linen, fine linen. And he made him ride in the second chariot, which he had. So number one chariot was Pharaoh, the kingly chariot. He was riding in number two, in effect, the prime minister. The prime minister's chariot is what would be Joseph's. Um, and they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set, them, set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. This is amazing. Because in effect, what it's saying is all of the land are to be your servants, Joseph. They are to serve this purpose because this has been shown, this dream and its interpretation to Pharaoh, in order for them to save themselves from certain death and famine. So he said, all of, all of Egypt is to serve you by hand and foot at your command. How amazing. When Pharaoh called Joseph's name, uh, Zaphnath Paneer, um, Zaphnath Paneer, and he gave him as a wife, Asnath, the daughter of uh, Poti Perar, priest of On. So he chose his most spiritual possession, the priest of On, and his daughter. So not had only given Joseph uh, these uh, or the the dress of authority. And, and, a, and a chariot. But imagine after all those years in the, uh, in the dungeon, in the company, uh, I'm quite sure, of men and only men, here he was given uh, a beautiful young woman as a wife, uh, the daughter of the priest. Um, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Just imagine how uh, Joseph's day had started in its usual mundane way in the darkness of a dungeon, cold and dank, serving prisoners, yet again bringing them in their breakfast, making sure their bonds and chains were in place and all right organizing the things of the prison, doing it on behalf of the prison captain who had handed all authority to him to run the prison, perhaps in laziness as much as anything else. But it started the day like that and it finished. That same day finished with him being prime minister of all of Egypt with um, the king's signet ring on his hand, uh, a chain of authority around his neck and fine linen to, to go about his business and a, uh, and a wife with which uh, we find out that he started a family. So Joseph went through all the land of Egypt and he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, 
And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. So there he was. What, a, what an incredible exchange. What an incredible development over this particular day. A day of coming vision that had landed in his lap. Now, so we go into to the outworking, the strategy, if you like, which Joseph had given. Now, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. Um, and because he knew, and I call this Joseph's wisdom, because he knew what was coming, he gathered up all the food uh, of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. There was an abundance, there was plentiful, there was enough for everybody to eat and so much more besides, which would have gone to waste if it wasn't for Joseph and his plans that he outworked as God had shown him to do. He gathered uh, later in the city food which surrounded them. Verse 49 here, Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable what he had stored up. Verse 50, and to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whose, uh, whom uh, Asnath, the daughter of Poti Ferrar, the priest of On, bore to him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, uh, for God made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Now, uh, Manasseh means forgotten, forgetfulness, Forget it, it was a matter of forget it and put it behind you. Almost forgive and forget. That's the, the essence of this, of this Manasseh, because he's come to a different place. Maybe for all those years in the dungeon, he was pining for his past life and his beautiful coat of many colors. But now he had something of worth and he was able to forgive, forget, to move on. Um, if you like. And so that was the name of his firstborn. Verse 52, and the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Uh, uh, fruitfulness in affliction. Well, all of Israel was going to learn fruitfulness in affliction in the coming days and years and indeed centuries. Um, but, uh, but Joseph had learned that fruitful times can come in a land of affliction. But partly that depends on the first thing, Manasseh. Forgetting, forgiving, and putting behind you that which has gone before, releasing yourself from the past in order to grasp hold of the future. That's a tremendous lesson which God teaches his people. We'll consider it more as we go. So those are the two boys born to him, Manasseh and Ephraim, forgetfulness and fruitfulness. Verse 53, then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. The famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when it says it was all the lands, it had spread out, not just from Egypt. In actual fact, it was the whole known world which fell under this great famine. Um, and there was no bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. He'd entirely passed over this administrative burden and the watchfulness of the vision working out to Joseph. So go and ask him what to do. The famine was all over the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians and the famine became very severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph to buy uh, to, in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Now, um, it became severe in Egypt, but it be also became severe, it's telling us again, in all lands. And they came to Joseph and he sold the grain. Doesn't say he gave it away, he sold it. He had worked hard in charge of the country for seven years, building storehouses. We've got a picture of grain silos here, uh, which are being filled. And he had done it in every city. 
He'd organized that. The work of the hands of the people was given to his responsibility by Pharaoh. So he had got them to build these storehouses, these, uh, these grain silos, uh, which had to be proof uh, from vermin. It had to keep the grain in good condition. Uh, and he had done all of that. That work had been done. And so now it was his to um, decide what to do with them. And he sold it to the Egyptians. We find out later that he wasn't selling it for profit, his personal profit. He was selling it for Pharaoh. His work ethic was to work for the king, for Pharaoh. And we find that more and more as this developed. We'll look into that another time. But uh, the famine came, became severe, not just in Egypt, but to all the country in lands. And and just like any good soap opera, this chapter ends again with a sense of da da da, what's coming next? We can put it in there. Da da da, things are going to move because it wasn't just Egypt. God's vision was bigger than just for Egypt, it was for all of the lands around. And, and so we move into that place in the coming chapters. Well, just before we leave um, this chapter, I did say last time that as we just think of Joseph and uh, we started this with two more full years being spent in jail, we could maybe take a moment to consider those prisoners of faith. And so I've got one for you, which I've looked up as well. So this lady is called Fatime Bakhteri, a Christian woman imprisoned in Iran on the 31st of August last year for, and this is the typical sort of charge which they raise against anybody talking about Christianity, propaganda against the government after earlier refusing pressures from a judge to renounce her faith. A convert from Islam, uh, Fatima was pressured by two judges to renounce her faith, but she refused to do so. In May 2019, her appeal was then rejected. She was summoned to start her jail term at Even Prison. We've heard that before because the last person we looked at in Iran again was also in Even Prison, where there's a, a lot of pressure and torture which goes on. So it's, it's notorious, it says, the prison is notorious for prolonged interrogations and abusive treatment of inmates. She was also banned for two years from engaging in any social activity with more than two people. Imagine that, more than two people. And, and, that, and that would be enough to land her in, in prison if she was out and waiting trial or maybe when she's out after doing a sentence for two years engaging in any social activity of more than two years what a what a terrible uh, thing to be read over her so let's just pray and think about Fatima Bakari Bakteri uh, Heavenly Father we want to lift this lady before you who's been charged uh, on these trumped up charges of uh, uh, propaganda against the government and Father, we pray that you would reveal truth, that you would stand by her, that uh, just maybe as Joseph knew your presence in his cell and it made a difference, Lord, to him, that she will know the presence of God. And Lord, wonderful if she could have some other Christians alongside her to just be with her in her need of her fellowship and faith. And we pray, Lord, that you would give her every comfort that she needs to endure this time and indeed use it as a building time to strengthen her, Lord, not to weaken her, but to strengthen her in her faith and her stand, that she may know that the God of all ages is with her in that place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, I had the privilege um, uh, about a year ago of hearing uh, Terry Faith. Terry, who am I thinking of? Um, Terry. Um, the person who was uh, put in prison uh, in uh, having been the consul for the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was put, he was uh, put in chain to a, a radiator, is what we heard, for years. Terry Waite, it's come back to me, Terry Waite, bless him. Um, and he was the one who just explained so clearly that uh, somebody who's held like that is, hasn't done a crime, so hasn't got a sentence. Um, they're just in their captive for an interminable length of time. Uh, and so how good it is to remember those who are imprisoned for faith and not for doing wrong and to stand with them. Uh, well, there we are. I'll send that out on a mail check and we can have a look at it another time. 
Well, let's go back and think about the, the lessons of this story. Uh, we pick it up in, in verse 12, where it was saying that there was this, it was the butler who had suddenly remembered in the light of Pharaoh's dream and saying, well, I, I was in prison and there was this young Hebrew man with us and he gave us a correct interpretation to our dreams. Um, and, and it happened just as he said, I got put back and the, the, uh, uh, the baker got uh, hung. Um, uh, when Pharaoh was angry with us. Uh, maybe he could help you uh, trans, uh, translate, interpret your dreams, Pharaoh. Uh, and so what we see is two, two uh, times where Joseph is in effect being asked to do the same thing, interpret a dream. They were two years apart. One of them hardly mattered to him personally at all, and yet it was important. It was um, the preparatory opportunity to see if he could be obedient and trustworthy to, for the significant opportunity. And how often God does this, that he gives a, a preparatory opportunity for us to show our obedience. He'll just speak to us and say something. And it may seem that he's not asking us much. I mean, imagine being Moses, going through the desert uh, in the wilderness and seeing a fire, a bush on fire, which must happen many times in the desert, turning aside and being told, take your sandals off for you are standing in holy ground. Now, it's my belief that if Moses hadn't taken his sandals off and shown that preparatory obedience, that God would not have entrusted with him the significant obedience of going before Pharaoh. Now, Joshua was told the same thing when the captain of the Lord's host stood before him, uh, before they were going to go and take Jericho. Um, and he said, well, well, who are you? It's told the same thing. Take your sandals off your feet. This is holy ground. And you see, we have to, as Christians, get into holy ground. And holy ground is a ground of obedience if we are to be trusted with the vision of God. Um, David. David showed his, his bravery and his ability and his raising of gifts in that he was defending sheep before he was defending Israel as king. And he defended sheep against a bear and a lion, that were told. And he knew that God had been with him in defending sheep against a bear and a lion when he went out to face Goliath. He was this huge man, 10 feet tall, with a, a spear like a weaver's beam, uh, with all the, you know, just bristling in weapons and, and waiting to destroy anybody in his path. And he had been, uh, he, he had been, calling this out against the, the army of Israel day after day, send me a champion and whoever wins will be the ruler and whoever loses will be servants. And there came David with the sure knowledge that he had been obedient and shown trust of God with the bear and the lion. And so God would be with him against this Goliath and, and following on from that in making him king. Obedient in the little to be set over the much, obedient in the preparatory, to be given the significant. Where are we in that? What has God shown us? What has he asked us to do? Don't leave it undone. However small it seems, step into the place of obedience, because as he has said, if for the funds who are faithful over little, I'll set you over much. Well, uh, Moses had become obedient and trusting, so much so that when he was called before Pharaoh, he didn't say that thing of, yes, I can do it, trust me, this is me being able to interpret your dream when the, when the ma magicians can't. No, he went straight to the Lord uh, and he told Pharaoh, it's, it's a God in heaven who can interpret dreams uh, and he will do it for you. And he, he was going to put the credit where it truly belonged in the hands of God. Um, uh, and so it was that he was going to interpret it for him. And, and God gave him this, not only the interpretation, which, which as Joseph said, God had given it to him twice through the cows and the uh, sheaves of corn with the seven heads of corn, but God gave him the interpretation as well. And as Pharaoh looked around and said, well, who is there that isn't a man like this with wisdom that could, that could carry this out and could do it for me? And so, um, and so what Joseph d did, and, and we've thought about how his day changed so radically from the cell to the chariot 
uh, from being enclosed into a dungeon to having the freedom of all of Egypt, from being in charge of a bunch of prisoners to being in charge of everybody in the land of Egypt. What God put his hand to was just awesome. But he went out and he went out with the wisdom that had been given to him, the wisdom of Joseph, to store up in the years of plenty so that you might have in the years of famine. Now, I've been sharing some of my uh, testimony uh, along the way in, in this series of Joseph, and uh, I kind of shared how God gave me a sense of real calling to this place in Plymouth. And when I found myself out of the Navy, that uh, I, I turned around and I headed this way, and through circumstances, God got me working in Aggie Weston's Royal Sellers Rest, Mission to the Navy. And, um, and before too long, uh, I met up with two of the sailors that I'd been on board ship with, HMS Fearless, they had a, a bed sit in the, uh, in the city and, and I moved in and, and had a bed sit alongside them. Uh, so I had a, an accommodation there. Um, and for me, uh, they became years of plenty. And I want to explain it to you like this. Um, I think at the time I was earning, this was in 1977, I was earning 28 pounds a week. 28 pounds a week, that doesn't sound much now. It wasn't much then. But it was enough to enable me to rent this bed sit um, uh, and to live in the city, feed myself. Uh, uh, that, not much more than that, but I could do that. Um, but also, uh, I did run my car. I'm, I'm amazed how I could do that off, off uh, the, that amount of money, but I did run my car. And I joined in a, a children's work to do with uh, Aggie Rastons, which was out at St. Budo, working in the uh, naval estate, as it was then. I think it's all been sold off now, but the naval estate on Bombard, and working in a children's work there and being blessed there. But what I do remember clearly is that I had a bed sit uh, uh, and I had no TV. Um, I think I probably had a radio, but I had no TV and I did not need one. What I had instead was an open Bible. And I would go out, I would do my day's work, come back, uh, eat, feed myself. And then it was my joy and privilege to open my Bible. And I was so, so hungry for the word of God. I just devoured it. I read and I read. And I'd follow chain references. I'd open up, there'd be a little chain reference column in the middle and I'd see something and I'd chase it back in that beginning of the Bible. I'd chase it to the later part of the Bible. I'd make connections between where it fell in all the places. I'd go on further through. I'd, I'd begin to understand more. I'd, I'd read through the Bible. I'd, I'd dived into it. Um, it, it, just, it was just wonderful to me. And, the, and I just want to go in and I can remember the dark evenings where I'd go in, I'd sit at a small table with an office, office lamp and I'd press a button on my office lamp, it would illuminate, I'd open Bible and just feed on the wonderful truths of God. It was a very precious time like that. I can remember going to a Bible study one time and uh, a Bible study and prayer meeting and there was somebody in it who said, well, who of us could have had such a good time at home if we hadn't come to this Bible study? And I, I felt positively sorry for them because I'd had a good time in the Bible study and it had been a good Bible study, but I could go home and have a great time in God's Word. It was very, very precious. And, and actually, um, it, was, it was a period of about three or four years um, that I had singlehood, I had no TV, I had little distractions, and I poured into God's Word. It was years of plenty in which I fed myself upon God's word. And in essence, it, it provided for me a foundation of understanding, which I've been able to live off ever since, because life doesn't stay like that. And years of plenty do not last. And, and I want us to really look into this wisdom of, uh, of, of uh, Joseph at this time, of making the most of the years of plenty, of creating a storehouse of treasure of God, whatever that may mean, for years of famine that may come later, because he had with which to share, because he had stored it up. Now, this, this can happen in, in many ways. It doesn't have to be a famine of food. It could be a famine, it could be a famine of friends. And so if we make lots of friends, when we have opportunity, we'll have them for when it's years of famine and we don't. It can be money. We can store up, we can store up a, an amount of money because it may not always be like that and we'll have it. And we know we don't want to store up money to be a personal treasure. We want to give to the Lord. We want to be obedient. But there are things that we store up in plenty to use in times of famine. 
It may be rooms in our house that we can be hospitable with when people need a bed. There are, uh, it can be sort of um, uh, friendship, fellowship, phone calls. There's all sorts of things that we can store up to give out um, when it's needed. And, and I've just shared what was to me an example of that. There are divine seasons of plenty. Grab hold of those seasons. It's like being on the mountaintop with Jesus at the transfiguration. Grab hold of those times. Grab hold of the glory. Grab hold of the experience. Do you remember uh, Moses who wanted to see God and was allowed, tucked into the cleft of a rock until God went by and he could see his back and he stored up the glory and held on because uh, what about the glory when he spent 40 days on Mount Sinai being, being revealed to him, the, the Ten Commandments and the laws and the tabernacle and all of that. He took it down, he stored it up and worked it out through his life. There are times of plenty, a divine season of plenty to hold that and to store it up because you will need it in times that go on. So um, it, it went on into what we found out was that uh, uh, that he'd been given this job because he was the one with the strategy he'd been given the wisdom because he had god with him he'd been given a signet ring on his finger the king's signet ring now um we were looking when we were in Hitri at haggai and the character of zerubbabel who was the governor and um and he was a faithful leader of israel and, and Haggai gave various prophetic words, but the very last one, in just the last couple of verses in Haggai 2 and verse 23 it is, it, there was a, a, a word which God had gave Haggai for Zerubbabel, who had been this governor, this leader. Um, and God told him, you have been a faithful servant, you are my signet ring. And it's one of the most lovely things God could ever have said. You are my signet ring. Because a signet ring on the hand of a king was what was used as the stamp of authority for the laws which went out, the edicts went out, everything which went out from the king, the treasury maybe, everything out there had the uh, uh, um, melted wax from the candle and the stamp of the king's signet ring. Now, uh, Joseph was given the signet ring of the king and of that authority. Um, his name changed, uh, and his name was changed to Zafnath Pania. And that's, uh, I've looked up the meaning of that. It means, Zafnath was an Egyptian word meaning God speaks. So, so the Pharaoh had seen that in Joseph, that God was speaking through him. And Pania means he lives. He lives. God speaks, he lives. Now that's interesting. God speaks because he lives. God speaks and therefore I live. God speaks and therefore there is life. God is life. God is light. God is holiness. God is life. God speaks. He lives. Pharaoh had come to something very special as an understanding. No wonder he had handed over the reins of power to this man through whom God speaks and he lives. And he gave him this wife and these two sons who were born, Manasseh and Ephraim, forgetfulness and fruitfulness. No wonder Joseph was able to step into this role and step into this place. And we've got to remember, we found out at the end of that passage that he was 30 years old when he came to that place and he had languished in prison, but he hadn't just languished. He hadn't just been in the doldrums or there in his chains. He had promoted himself through the prison in order to be the leader of the prison and to look after. This had been entrusted to him even as a prisoner, just as he had been as a slave looking after Potiphar's house. But it took him from 17 years old to 30 years old. Now isn't 30 a, um, a significant age when we think of Jesus? He's, he got baptized and began his ministry when he was 30. And here Joseph is beginning to be able to outwork his vision of life at last. At last his character and his gifting had caught up with his vision. He was given a vision at 17 and blurted it out and just caused hatred and jealousy because he did not have the character to fulfill it. And it wasn't for that time. And it wasn't in that place. But God was working it all out. The time and the place and the man were brought together in a vision for a time. Like Esther, he could say, for such a time as this, 
he had been put in this place. How wonderful that it was. You know, God gave him that vision in two nights. The dream of uh, sheaves of corn bowing down to his one night and the dream of stars, the sun and moon bowing down to his star the second night. In two nights, God had given him the vision for his life. But it took another 13 years before the gifting and the character was sufficient and the timing was right for Joseph to be working out. There's a very deep and real lesson for us in there, in the lesson of waiting, we've considered that, in the lesson of overcoming temptation, in the lesson of focusing on, in, on, on the, the, uh, the, the person and the, and of God for him. And he had done that. It was revealed through, through the fact that he said, well, God interprets dreams. Uh, I'll be there with you and for you, but God interprets this only as I wait upon him that I can serve you in this way. He brought that gifting and character to it. And, you know, uh, again, just extending uh, my testimony in this, if I, if I look back through that time, um, I, I became a, a young man uh, who'd filled himself up with the word of God, um, but couldn't uh, always uh, give that out in a, in a proper way. But I was given special opportunity, and it was actually because I worked for Aggie Weston's, which was a Christian mission. And at the time, the pastor that I was under, Alec Passmore, bless him, Zion Church, um, it, it was because I was in a Christian mission, as a 22-year-old, he said, oh, Chris, come and, come and speak to the church, come and preach, you must be able to do so. And, uh, and in a sense, I was able to do so, because in Aggie Westerns, I'd been given that small opportunity, that, that, that thing I was talking about at the beginning, about being given a preparatory opportunity in order to have a bigger opportunity. And my preparatory opportunity was in this organisation, an institution of a building and, uh, and a kitchens and cleaners and, and all the rooms that sailors lived in. I'd been given the opportunity. They had daily prayers for staff. And it was just a five minute thought and a prayer before the staff went to work. And because I was in there and working with the mission, I was given Tuesdays. And it, it happened every day, but on a Tuesday, it was my day. And just for five minute thought and a prayer, I would share that. And over this period of sort of between 19 and over three years, God began to build into me this speaking and sharing and praying the word of God. And so when it came to doing it in the church, um, I was able to unpack the word of God because of that. And a, a really lovely dear lady came to me afterwards and she said, well, where's he been hiding? Because they didn't realize a 22 year old was going to be able to share like this, but it was because of what God had done. And so through the years, I was given these occasional opportunities to share the word of God. And indeed, um, when I came to New Life, which was in 1987, 10 years later, um, I, did, I did nothing for uh, about a year or six months. And then VJ got to hear that I had been doing some Bible teaching and asked me to share in the fellowship. And I began speaking and sharing uh, throughout that time, every about six, six weeks or so, I'd have that opportunity. Uh, and it was wonderful just to build that, such that um, uh, when VJ came to the age of 70, and I think I was about 42 at the time, something like that, he asked me to come for a meal with him and he said, um, I'm looking for somebody to help lead in, in new life. He said Keith was going to step up to the role of pastor, but he would like me to step up to the role of teacher. And, 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 and in this sense, finally, I was moving into the role of teacher. Now, I'd had those years of plenty. But in between that time, I've had four children. And believe me, when you've got four children and a house to keep, you do not have the quantity of time uh, to give to studying the Bible, but I'd, I had a storehouse, which I was then able to dip into and to give out and to share, just like Joseph had of his grain storehouses. Mine was of the bread of life, the wonder of what Jesus was, and I began to be able to share that. Well, it was 2004, it was 27 years after coming to Plymouth and hearing that word about serving in the city, 27 years later that I was asked to serve in the church as a leader alongside Keith and uh, Keith and Pauline. And, and, and I would just like to testify and say here now, I will be eternally grateful for Keith and Pauline and the huge effort and ministry that they poured into new life over those years until just the other year when, when Keith stepped down. Uh, a, a wonderful ministry that went on, but God had called him to his ministry and he had called me to mine. So that was in about 2004. Well, it was 2007. Suddenly then I was out of teaching 
I could immerse myself more in the leadership, but as well I heard the call uh, because a vacancy had arisen in churches together in Plymouth. And I heard that call. Uh, and first of all, I started thinking, well, I've been praying into it with the people who met in Pray Plymouth on Wednesday mornings. And they were saying, we need a new uh, leader to be uh, churches together in Plymouth. Roger is uh, standing down, who Roger was in St. Matthias back along then. Um, and, uh, and I started thinking, well, who could do it? Maybe I could ask that leader or that leader or that leader. And I described it as that original and first advert for the lottery. And if you remember that, there was a huge finger pointed out the sky and it came down and the lottery finger was, it could be you. And suddenly God was saying to me, it could be me. And I thought, oh my goodness, it could be. I could give some time to that ministry. And so I suggested it, I prayed with various people, stepped into it. Um, and so that, that began and, and it was this sense of calling that I'd had to the city. But it was now 30 years after being a 19 year old that I was 49, that I stepped into that ministry as well. So God has to build faith, build character, build gifts. There's a verse in Proverbs which says this, Proverbs 18 and verse 16 says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Your gift, God will make room for your gift. He made room for mine. And that's what I've been sharing a testimony about. And when it goes on to say it will bring him before great men, I've just been astounded what's happened over these, those years. Um, in actual fact, when I was in teaching, um, and because I, I was a head teacher in teaching of a, a Church of England primary school, and we were involved in the Queen's Golden Jubilee when she'd been on the throne 50 years, because she came down to Cornwall and the teachers and some of the children from uh, Church of England schools, and after all, she's the head of the Church of England, were asked to go and meet her. So I met the Queen and I sort of talked to Prince Philip and it's, I'm amazed now that I had that opportunity. And then in, when my, in my other school, um, it, which was, uh, went through an Ofsted and was deemed outstanding, I was asked to go and meet with Prince Charles because he was part of the influence and idea to say, why don't we train our future teachers in the schools which have been identified by Ofsted as outstanding? And I met, I met Charles and I had about a 15-minute conversation with him. Gifts make room and brings before great men. And even now in the work of Churches Together in Plymouth, I'm on first-name terms with the three MPs in the city with the council leader, Tudor Evans, and the leader of the council, Tracy Lee. Um, and there is opportunity to step forward for the city, for faith, for the Christian, for the ministry of the church. And I'm just staggered by the room that's been created and the people that it's brought me before. And I just so value your prayers in that because my vision, like Joseph's, had to go to the pit. It had to die. And I've talked to you about that in, in previous uh, testimonies that it, it had to die uh, and there I was in, in Aggies uh, serving the sailors and wiping out ashtrays and wondering what's happening Lord but chuckling to myself with a piece of God in my heart knowing that he would bring it to pass in his own timing. God's got his hand on you for his timing uh, and we need to heed the call. We need to hear the call in the preparatory obedience so that we can step into the bigger obedience so that we can step further into full obedience. Well, seven years of plenty uh, went through and seven years of famine followed. And indeed, um, Joseph could open, could open up his storehouses that he be, and begin to sell to the people of Egypt. And Joseph didn't know it yet, but the vision was bigger than Egypt. And maybe he did, maybe he was waiting for more, but the vision wasn't, wasn't to rescue Egypt for the sake of Pharaoh. That's what Pharaoh thought it was. But actually all the known world all the countries were in famine and they would start coming to Joseph too. And a whole new pathway would open up before him. I'll tell you this, whatever we think God's vision is for us, the tendency is it's bigger than that. Um, I, I had a heart for where I was living for, for years, in, in, which was in Plymouth in Stoke Village. And I had a heart and a vision for Stoke Village. In fact, it's that that brought me to new life because New Life used to meet in Stoke um, Community College when I joined it. And, and that's what brought me to New Life in the first place. I had a vision for Stoke, but, but then God's along the pathway said, no, actually it's a vision for Plymouth. And in some circles, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see that God has put me in a place where I can speak for him in this city and serve him in it. But in recent years, from 2016, I've been involved with these police work, which is actually Devon and Cornwall, and we're spreading the things which have happened 
through making church serve city and, and making a gateway between the two. And, and that has expanded and, and I've been given time to do that, which is, which is just wonderful. God has a bigger vision than you can ever realize because there is a great exchange that goes on. And when we think of laying down our life and laying down our vision in God's hands, he picks it up and turns it into something so glorious. And one special day, there was such a great exchange that God took Joseph's prison rags, which he was in. And after all, it says in Isaiah, all of us be, have become as one who's unclean and even our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's where God picks us up. And he dressed him instead in fine linen on that day that he met Pharaoh. And Revelation 19 verse 8 says that fine linen, bright and clean, was given to the bride of Christ to wear for her wedding day at the marriage feast of the Lamb. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. He took rags and he gave us fine linen and he's done that for Joseph, for me, for you. Oh, how it is to be dressed in God. And, and Joseph started that day in prisoner's chains, uh, wrapped around his feet uh, and uh, wrapped, around, wrapped around his wrists. But that evening, God enabled Pharaoh to put his, around his neck a chain of authority. And God takes off your chains of the past. Manasseh, put it away forgetfulness move on from resentments and jealousies and hurts of the past which bind us and chain us to the to the back uh, and give us a, a a vision for the future with a, a chain of god's authority around our neck one of the lovely phrases i always remember vj saying in his ministry he said you can't drive a car looking in the rearview mirror and too often we're stuck looking in the past when we ought to be looking to the future. What a wonderful thing it is to have chains gone and a chain of authority, God's authority put around our neck because it says in Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, behold, I have given you authority. He said it to it his disciples as he sent them out. And, and this wonderful truth as well, that the fetters around the wrists of Joseph as a changed prisoner had been changed for a signet ring put on his finger of the king's authority wherever he went. We have God's authority when we're in God's purpose, carrying out God's vision. Let's step into a bigger purpose, a bigger vision, an eternal one, because he's... All that's gone before was only to equip us for what lies ahead. And with the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the divine exchange, we can step into a bigger future than has been our past. Your old can swap from our, for, for the new. We step out of natural into supernatural. We step out of the temporal into the eternal. We step out of rigs, rags into eternal riches because that is God's calling upon us. Well, we want to bow to that. We want to give God every opportunity to say yes lord i'll stand in the gap i want to serve you with everything i've got with all of my days with all of my future and god will make it a great future and a bigger future than we could ever imagine praise the lord heavenly father as we think upon these truths we pray that you will lead us forward into our future into our destiny and whilst lord at this time it may seem that the the uh, present is closed in that it's almost like there's some prison doors uh, a door of opportunity which hasn't opened yet one day can change that and two dreams can become an eternal future when your hand is upon it and you've raised us up raise us up lord for this special time we pray in jesus name amen amen well god bless you and we'll see you again for uh, a future bit of joseph bless your heart thank you